Good evening. Welcome back to the show where new media meets New York. Tonight, a special edition. On April 5th, Crane's New York Business held a breakfast at which Eric Enquist and I interviewed Deputy Mayor for Economic Development Bob Steele about New York's future in technology jobs, affordable housing, and more. Here is the whole event. It's about an hour. It begins with opening remarks by the Deputy Mayor. It's really my pleasure to be here on behalf of Mayor Bloomberg and the rest of my colleagues in the administration. Uh, I also want to reiterate my thanks to the Partnership for New York and to Cranes and to Delta Airlines for providing the sponsorship for this morning. It's great for me to have an opportunity to come and visit with you, offer some of the things that we're thinking about the administration, and also, given the format of today, to have the chance to hear some questions from people who I know think about these issues all the time, and I'm looking forward uh, to hearing their perspective on what issues they believe are most important, and we can focus on them. Uh, I'm going to talk just hopefully for about 15 minutes um, and, and try to frame some issues that I think are important. <clears throat> it's tempting when you come to something like this to try to paint with large brush strokes on the issues and the things we're thinking about and present a picture that's exciting and dynamic. And we're going to do that, I'm convinced, during the question and answer period. But I thought what I might do to start with is try to frame something that's really in the front of our mind at City Hall. And it's not because I mean to be downbeat or unoptimistic, but instead I think it's something that all of us as citizens and people that care about New York and we care about the people of New York needs to have on the front of their mind. And that is really the issue uh, of um, focusing on um, jobs and unemployment and things like that. Um, our administration uh, fundamentally believes that government, um, whether it's federal, state, or local, uh, is not the source of economic growth. Uh, but instead, government does have a vital role to play, and that is promoting growth by creating a supportive environment uh, under which businesses can grow and private sector businesses can expand, hire more work workers, and create opportunities for the future. That's a distinction that's really fundamental to the way we uh, approach and think about all of these problems. Uh, part of fostering that government, that environment, is to think about how we can make New York City an attractive place to live, work, and visit. And this is where I believe the record of my boss, Mayor Bloomberg, speaks for itself. Uh, crime is at an all-time low, streets and water have never been cleaner, and we've invested more in our parks and cultural institutions than any other administration in the city's history. But despite all of this progress, and a lot of progress it is, too many New Yorkers, our fellow citizens, are suffering the effects of the worst economic downturn in our lifetime. So in addition to maintaining our focus on fostering conducive economic environment, the Bloomberg administration is trying to become much more proactive than ever in our efforts to get New York's businesses growing again and to get New Yorkers back to work. Let me this morning talk about four key initiatives uh, that target this issue. First, we want to talk about making it easier for businesses to open, expand, and prosper in New York City. Second, we want to talk about supporting small businesses. And the reason for this small business focus is not because of a lack of appreciation for the import of large businesses, but the truth is when you understand that small businesses were more negatively affected by the recession than large businesses. So these are the people that need a bit more attention now when we put our thumb on the scale to help them get back on their front foot because we all know the import of small businesses to the overall economy. Thirdly, I'd like to speak for a few minutes about increasing job placement and workforce skill development efforts. And lastly, taking a longer term perspective and talking about the ideas that support emerging industries and the long term job creation and ambitions for our city. But before we go through those four things, let me take a second just to frame the issue as I like to do when I'm trying to understand something for, and really get down to the weeds. At the onset of this recession, very few people believed Mayor Bloomberg when he said on the day that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy that whatever was coming our way, he would rather have New York's hands, hand to play than any other city. And now that we're recovering from the depths of this crisis, we can see that he was quite correct and somewhat prescient. New York's economy has added jobs faster than the rest of the country. 
Our economy is incredibly diverse, with three different sectors each representing more than 10 percent of all employment. One of New York's real advantages is that people want to be in New York. People want to live in New York, and people want to visit New York. Unlike most other large cities in the country, New York's population has continued to grow throughout the downturn. Even if you look at the lower than expected and somewhat surprising recent census results, we still showed New York's population as growing. Last year, a record 48.7 million tourists visited New York, making us the number one tourist destination in the United States. And more than 30 percent of all the foreign visitors to the United States came to New York, which is a pretty impressive market share. So by almost any measure you choose, New York City has weathered this economic storm pretty well and is starting to come out of it in better shape. But while we are proud of this performance, as I said to you in my introductory comments, we also have to recognize that on an absolute basis, we're no means as healthy from an economic perspective in New York City as we would wish to be. Unemployment has come down, but is still an unattractively high 8.9 percent. This figure actually masks, in my perspective, uh, some of the more challenging aspects and areas of the city that are still hurting. Unemployment in the Bronx is nearly 13 percent. 14 and 12 percent of the black and Hispanic workforce, respectively, are out of work. The city's construction industry today employs 20 percent fewer people than at the onset of the crisis, and the manufacturing sector has also seen job erosion nearly at the same level. People often speak about unemployment in terms of the headline number of 8.9 or 9 percent, but let me make a couple of additional comments that bring more context to this single number. This number doesn't take account for people who would like to be working more and are basically underemployed in addition to being unemployed. There also is an issue that, that really escapes general discussion, and that is the issue of duration of unemployment. Uh, we've seen in this recession duration lengthen, and as a result, many people are feeling extraordinarily str great stress as the churn rate of, of unemployment has go gone down during this period, and as a result, people are out of work for longer, which has a much more deleterious effect to their lifestyle, to their standard of living, and effect on their lives. So that's why getting people back to, to work is the number one priority for our administration. When you think about the numbers, we have about 3.2 million people working, and about another half million or so were employed by the various governments, federal, state, and local, and making for about 3.7 million worker, New Yorkers who are working. But if you do the interpolation, that leaves about 400,000 of our fellow citizens who are not working. And if you want to assume some type of full employment of 5 percent or so, you can see we have some work ahead of us to get several hundred thousand of those people back to work. So that's our plan. And so now let me talk and shift to the four factors I said I would talk about quickly. First, business customer service. Spurring private sector job creation starts with treating our city's businesses as customers. We want to make it as easy as possible for businesses to open, expand, and prosper in New York. Regulation and consumer protection exist for very good reasons, and it is the job of government to ensure that businesses are providing safe products and services. But New Yorkers are also, and that New Yorkers are also getting what they pay for, and our workers are protected on the jobs. But this sensitivity to regulation is about striking the right balance between these responsibilities and the need to allow and encourage businesses to uh, operate and expand. So in city government, uh, we focused on a series of initiatives designed to make it easier for businesses to open and expand. We've launched um, something we call business consumer service, where the, where the real, the real issues people face is the challenges of permits and agencies with which they interact. Our city currently issues 400 permits, licenses, and certificates, most of which require unproductive in-person paper applications, and only a few can be completed or tracked online right now. But I can tell you this is something and my fellow colleague, Deputy Mayor Steve Goldsmith, are focused on and pledged to do something about. The business customer service project will coordinate all of the city's interactions with businesses so they can work together to help businesses and further simplify processes such as these. 
We've also launched a new business acceleration team to help small businesses, particularly restaurants, navigate the complex process of getting open and in business. In a little more than one year, we've already helped more than 250 businesses get through this process. Next, let me talk to the second component of this job creation strategy, and that is the effort to increase the, the business customer services focus so we can be proactive in providing support to help businesses grow and expand. Small businesses, which I referenced earlier, play a key part in New York's economy. Nearly half of New York's workforce is employed by the 90% of the city's businesses that employ fewer than 50 people. So half the people come from these small businesses, half the workers. Our focus on small business, as I said, is driven by the fact that many of these were hit harder in the recession than some of their larger people. Our area of focus is to help New York's small businesses cultivate their own talent. Successful businesses are businesses that invest in their own people, and technology continues to involve and play a role in virtually every industry, so even higher premium is placed on skill development. But for many small businesses, designing comprehensive training is often expensive, and a one-size-fits-all training is often insufficient. So we're making more funds available to more businesses to help them design customized training, invest in their people, and grow their businesses. I recently met with a family-run business in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning business in Long Island City, and they were able to describe by using these funds to build a curriculum so that each of their workers could advance and increase their skills and move up to supervisory positions, which allowed them to fill in underneath them with more technicians. Clearly an example of leverage with a long stick working to make businesses grow in a more productive fashion. These grants help businesses create more jobs pay higher wages and grow their businesses. And we think of that as a win-win and win. Um, I think the um, last thing I might mention is our business solution centers, which are focused on job placement and workforce skill development efforts. Um, here we've created a series of workforce one centers that help job seekers with one-to-one -one time job and career counseling, technical and educational services, workshops, and referrals to training programs. We're focused on helping New Yorkers build the skills employers are hiring for the future. I've had the pleasure of visiting several of these centers in different boroughs, and they're impressive places, places that are welcoming and encouraging to someone who's out of work or looking to improve their position. Early in this administration, Mayor Bloomberg made a seemingly small change as to how we organize our workforce and business assistance efforts that in retrospective has been crucial to our success. Previously, we had one agency that was in charge of helping small businesses and a separate agency in charge of helping people find jobs and never the twain shall meet. So if you have a company now that comes in to get help with its business plan, which includes a need to hire 10 or 20 people, we now can match them much more easily with the people who have the right skills to, um, to fit with what their needs are so they can get going in a, different, in a better way. And so having them joined at the hip uh, really serves to make this more efficient and more effective. What was placing uh, several hundred people now will place placed over 30,000 matches of people with opportunities last year, and we're now planning to expand this by 10,000 more to hopefully this year have 40,000 people who get connected with opportunities in a perfect way. I was recently in Queens at the center there and saw that one of someone from the aviation industry was sitting in the Workforce One Center using their conference rooms as their interviewing facilities. The people in Workforce One had produced a list of applicants and candidates that allowed the employer to find the right people in an efficient and effective way. So you saw before your eyes people being matched with opportunities and businesses finding it more efficient and effective to connect with what they wanted. So now, let me take the longer term perspective for just a few minutes before we shift to questions. Uh, we're also focused in the administration on the next generation of potentially large employers. Businesses in many cases haven't yet been founded, but that one day could create thousands of jobs. I know like me, you were all excited to read about Google taking over a whole block in Chelsea and describing their plans for what they expected to do and why it was crucial for them to be in New York. We're experiencing a resurgence of New York's startup culture, and New York City recently passed Boston as the second largest recipient of technology venture capital investments in the United States. Uh, companies like Foursquare, Etsy, and Second Market are flourishing here in the city. 
Just last week, we announced the results of our second annual Big Apps competition in which developers are given access to city data and invited to design applications. We got more than 50 outstanding submissions from the technology developers throughout the city. There's real energy in this sector now, and it's great to see it being applied when a transparency and solution-oriented attitude towards the problems of New York. The mayor and I were recently in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, where we met with some of the leading startups in the world. They all want to be in New York, like Google, and not just for sales and marketing, but because of the technology skills that are being offered to them and their businesses. So what we've also done to help make this hopefully become a bit more stimulated is to focus a network of incubator incubators on industries including technology, new media, sustainable design, food service, and fashion. One, our incubators provide discounted office space and other support that lets innovators do what they do best, focus on commercializing their ideas. We're also supporting startups with another crucial ingredient, mentorship and educational support. Last year, we launched the Venture Fellows Program with 23 promising entrepreneurs. Each fellow is teamed up with two to three mentors who are prominent investors, entrepreneurs, and corporate executives. Last year, when there was very little early stage venture capital being invested anywhere in the country, we created the NYC Entrepreneurial Fund, which partners city funds with private funds to invest in some of the most promising early stage startup companies in the city. And now, we believe in part because of the example this fund has set, we're seeing private money following our lead, and BMW recently announced they're creating a dedicated $100 million fund focusing on New York tech startups. In addition to all the things we're doing in the, in the immediate term to catalyze economic growth, we're also doing our very best to take significant steps to ensure long-term economic strength and stability. We're investing in public safety, parks, and education, as I said earlier, and we want to make sure that New York continues to be the place that people want to visit and live. We're also focused on economic development projects that will be game changers to our mind. Hudson Yards, which will add three to four times the amount of office space as Rockefeller Center, or the initiative to increase the city's engineering and applied science capacity, which I hope we can talk a bit more about in the Q&A. We want to be sure the economy truly recovers from the shocks of the last few years and that New York is positioned well to outperform in the years ahead and the decades to come. But our focus on this long-term opportunity cannot distract us from confronting the immediate challenges we face. I think we have to be in making it easier for businesses to open and expand, as I said, and continuing to support small businesses, increasing focus on job placements and workforce skills, and lastly, looking for the long term and supporting emerging industries. There are many positive signs in the economy, but as I said when I began, there's still too many New Yorkers suffering and for whom the talk of this recovery seems still premature. We can't do it alone in city government, as I said. This is about private industry and us giving you the opportunity to grow your businesses and be successful. This is the focus for the administration, uh, issue number one, two, and three are jobs, and hopefully that comes across. Thanks a lot, and let me have your questions. I wondered if you could first tell us, Mr. Deputy Mayor, what problems have proven more intractable, more difficult than you anticipated or would have expected in your first year uh, as Deputy Mayor? Well, um, I, I think the reality is that, uh, let's think about this together, there are two or three things. I, I believe that uh, from a policy perspective, just philosophically, we have a, a way we operate that the city or any other government has responsibilities that they're awarded sole responsibility for. And we can all think of the important services and activities that governments perform on behalf of all of us. But what that does is it often creates a dynamic uh, which is different from other parts of our economy where um, innovation and efficiency don't receive the natural encouragement or reward. And so a large part of what I believe that the mayor has encouraged us to think about is what can we do to make our government more effective and more efficient and to make it easier, as I said in my very first point, for people to do what they wish to do. Uh, and when we have 400 certificates and licenses and permits and a very small percentage of them are available online, then we're really not servicing people as we should. Uh, that isn't effective for them. 
So I think the first thing would be, uh, what can we do to make government more efficient? There's just a tendency to not uh, engage with change. Um, I think the second issue, and then I'll just use two, <clears throat> is that there is a reality uh, that we're dealing with a, a more challenging economic environment with real headwinds in some areas. And so the amount of capital or funds that you have to apply to issues uh, is different than you might wish. There are lots of great ideas that will be funded on a longer term or, or at a slower pace um, or not as quickly as we might optimally like. And that's just the reality uh, of the, um, the economic conditions. Now, there is a bit of a uh, parenthetical comment that's constructive, and that is my experience is that when you're going through stress, you have a better prospect of making real change than when uh, the sails are full with heavy wind and you're kind of uh, going uh, pretty easily. Uh, first, thank you all for including me in this. I really appreciate being able to participate. Deputy Mayor, you asked to be uh, asked about the Science and Engineering Campus Initiative. And I get the impression from some of the local universities competing for this um, that they weren't thrilled that this was open to non-New York universities, never mind non-US. And they feel that the issue here is not the local university's ability to create uh, knowledge and you know that kind of education at the leading edge, uh, but if if jobs aren't coming here or staying here in the tech sector, uh, and obviously they are to some degree, but if they're not doing so more, that it has more to do with the cost of living, particularly housing in New York. An example was given to me that, well, they don't, you know, the tech sector didn't grow in Palo Alto, where Stanford is. Uh, it grew through the Silicon Valley. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, first of all, if I'd known that I suggested questions that you would ask them, I would have suggested a lot more. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, the, um, so l let's, um, let's give a bit of runway to this whole issue because there were three or four questions in your one. Uh, um, so how did this happen or this idea develop? Uh, before I arrived, um, really at the time of um, the most stress in the financial services industry, uh, people in the administration began to discuss first internally and then outside the administration, what are the things we should be thinking about to strengthen the economy and diversify over time away from something that's been so important like financial services. That was the original idea. And what came back uniformly uh, long before I arrived was that people believed that strong skills at the highest level in engineering, science, and technology at the highest level would be valuable assets which would have a high yield over time. And with that premise, people began to think about how can we encourage incremental activity in this area, not just to have what would have happened by nature of its own course, but instead, what could we in the city do with our resources to encourage something greater and more robust? And so that was the idea, and this is a bit technical, but I think it's important, is we chose to issue an RFEI, which is a request for expression of interest, solely because we thought we didn't know so much about this and that we'd learn a lot from getting an RFE responses to an RFEI, and then we could write an RFP with more precision as to what we wanted to do. So given the idea that we wanted to learn about this, uh, we thought that, that uh, we wanted incremental activity, then we went about this process. A and uh, I think I can tell you that the idea was that we hope to hear from local schools who would describe to us an enhancement of their current ambitions. We hope to hear from schools in this region and then across the country and internationally, and that was the plan. So we've heard back uh, from these people, 20-some uh, schools and 18 or 19 different proposals, and they all came in about three weeks ago. Some of them are as long as 200 pages, and it's exciting that we have received reports uh, or, or proposals from people here in New York and we've received proposals from all of the different geographic areas I mentioned. So it's been a ratifying and encouraging response. I, I don't think there's any question, to try to get to your next point, that there are issues with New York with regard to cost of living and other factors too. But as we analyze the situation, we believe that it would be wrong not to think that more skills in this area would be a positive factor uh, in helping our economy grow in the future. And I guess really the, um, the, the, 
and we'll see, as you know, the city has suggested uh, that we'll help in lots of ways. We gave examples of real estate that we thought might be exciting, but said we're open to other ideas. We've suggested that we can buy, provide financial support and also the imprimatur of the city uh, with regard to people that want to make this type of expansion. My last point is that you know, New York has an incredibly rich uh, post-secondary uh, um, academic opportunity. Uh, people talk about college towns, and so we all listen to Cambridge or Ann Arbor or something like that. And the facts are is that New York has about 660,000 post-secondary students, which is more students than Boston has people. Uh, and so the idea that we should take a second seat uh, as a college town just doesn't make any sense at all. And we think this idea of highlighting these skills and, and encourage them is a good 10, 20, 30 year ambition for economy. Sorry, that went on Thank long, you. but. You oversee the Department of Finance, which we know collects property taxes. I'm beginning to hear a lot of complaints about property taxes. Not that the rates are going up, but that the assessments are going up. And particularly that there um, are preferred groups of property owners that seem to be protected for political reasons or otherwise from harm, specifically single family uh, homes for years have been protected in New York City. Yeah. And then there's a second division between older co-ops and condos and new construction, where we'll see a unit sell for $40 million has happened. We saw in the papers the other day, but the entire building is assessed for $5 million. How do you explain this, these discrepancies and why can't the city simply tax based on value? Well, um, there's no question that there's a lot of concern and reaction uh, to the recent announcement by the Department of Finance. Uh, a small story that was announced on the same day that I was lucky enough to go to the Rebney dinner. And so it was kind of like uh, 2,000 people all at once uh, telling me what they thought uh, on that same day. So I quickly learned this was a hot issue from lots of people's perspective. And you know, that's not a shy group. Uh, um, uh, um, so uh, let's be serious for a second. I think that um, there are issues of the recent changes uh, and assessment changes and there are issues of underlying structure of our taxes, and they're separate. Uh, um, and the issue of whether or not uh, our assessment adjustments is exactly right, uh, I'm sure that, um, that there are things that we can learn and do better from the recent assessment. Uh, and we've had lots of meetings um, with people who have come to give us very specific examples that point out the seeming inconsistencies that you highlight and we're keen to learn from them and see where we've got things wrong and make adjustments. That's with regard to the recent assessment. I think the second issue though, which is different, uh, is there are certain uh, um, uh, expressions that come about because of the way we've assessed taxes for a long period of time. Uh, and there are certain classes or groups that seem to be relatively uh, better positioned and others less well. And that's something we spent a lot of time talking. I can't tell you um, what we're going to do, but let me just assure you that seeming inconsistencies between classes and types we're well aware of, and we'll just have to decide if this is something we want to take on. Well, if there's any time to take it on, it would be when you're not running for re-election, right? So, I mean, can you provide us any type of commitment to... I think I just said exactly what I wanted to say, okay. and that is that, that we understand the issue. Uh, it's, and it's just the second issue is the complex one, uh, um, and that we talk about it a lot. And then there becomes the issue of um, what can get done and what the prospects are. But I think uh, I actually agree with your point that there are lots of things we should take on because of our uh, position, we have a thousand and one days left, not that anyone's counting. Uh, and, um, and as you said, we're in an incredibly special position uh, that we have lots of responsibility and stewardship, and we're not in a campaign. Um, a related question, perhaps, is the- Small R or capital R? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave it to the capital R representative here to ask the capital R question, if there is one. Uh, but they would probably be very interested in it because it has to do with the, uh, the collapse in construction since the financial crisis and the housing bust. Um, and if the administration is offering a robust enough response to that, uh, we know that the 80-20 program has expired. Um, some people in the industry say, even that won't be enough. 
without additional property tax relief uh, to really get construction going again. And again, it relates back to the, uh, to the cost of housing in the city, which has so many other overtones. So um, I highlighted in my comments, I think, that we still have uh, very unattractive um, levels of unemployment in the construction industry. Um, and um, you know, when you meet with people from the industry and hear about 20, 30, 40 percent of certain skills and, um, and expertises that are not working, then that certainly seems wrong. So recognizing the need to be supportive of, uh, of building and construction and housing is front of mind. I think there are three or four um, threads to this story, and let's just try to think through them together. One, I think, is 421A, uh, which has expired and we would advocate should be extended. I think 80-20, um, the issue that you raise, is, um, is one where um, there's no question there's a lot of support uh, for the idea uh, of, um, of trying to be helpful and encourage building. And you really have, this is where government gets a bit hard, because I think that there's an advocacy uh, for this uh, with the construction industry, with the development community, and things like that. But someone's got to represent the citizenry. And there is a price of subsidization. And I think getting that balance right uh, in the 80-20 is really the, the hard part of the balancing act that we're trying to do. So we're supportive of finding that right formula that, that basically is encouraging to people to build and, and to invest their money uh, and to expect a fair return and also provide housing, which is another part of it, because you have everyone uh, encouraging you uh, uh, to think constructively about this. But I do think we have to have a balance as to what's the price of subsidy so we get this right. And so that's the, the tension we're focused on. <clears throat> and uh, you know, from our perspective, we have a goal uh, of our new market housing place plan, which is to have 156,000 new units that we want to develop by the time the mayor leaves. Uh, we're in good progress, uh, making good progress and on track to reach that, but we've got to take all these factors into account. But I do think the cost of some of these things is important, too. If I could follow up for just a second, um, uh, HPD Commissioner Sestero was telling me the other day about um, the first uh, developers now to sign on to the program to convert market rate condos to affordable rentals, um, or at least affordable housing of one kind or another. Does, how, how much uh, potential do you think that has to create affordable housing in the city? And does it also indicate that we have a big sort of white elephant problem in New York? Well, um, I think the, the question of what's the best way to solve this, the marketplace will tell us. And if people are basically looking at converting some of these to affordable housing, that tells you that that's attractive. I don't have an in-hand prediction of what that is. I do think that when we looked at our target of, um, uh, of where we wanted to reach with a new, uh, new market housing plan, that probably the ratios changed uh, where conversion will be a bigger factor than new construction. Uh, when, which, when we, than we might have imagined you know, a year or two ago. Having said that, there are exciting new construction projects too, like Hunters Point South, which is 900 units, and things like that. So <clears throat> my conclusion would be you're correct, as is Raphael, to raise that. Uh, um, and as a result, the ratio of what will be conversions and the reaching our goal will be higher than we would have guessed before. And we should take this to, you know, um, it's always fun to be able to do this. Raphael retired last Friday and was a fantastic commissioner of HPD. And so um, it's good to recognize him. I'm glad you mentioned it. Thank you. What do you think is a fair return? You mentioned fair return. I think uh, if you build a new rental building now, uh, the property taxes are in the neighborhood of 35% of gross income, which after a builder's expenses is going to, they tell me, essentially turn out to be about half of their, of their net income. So why would anyone build, why, why would anyone lend to a project like that? And, and secondly, um, I don't think anyone's building these with 421A having expired. So does it tell you that there's something wrong, that no one will even start a project unless there's a tax abatement program? That expires, right? Your abatement eventually expires, and whatever affordable units are included with those uh, could be then converted to market rates. So you have two problems. You have a property tax situation that discourages people from building, and then you're relying on that for affordable housing, which is going to run out 10 or 20 years down the road. So uh, I think uh, I really have tried to address that, um, that we understand the challenges, um, and 
uh, I think you began the series of questions uh, with pointing out that um, construction is slow and unemployment is high in the trades and that we have a need for more construction activity. Uh, and then uh, um, you highlighted the, in your first question the issue of taxes uh, relating to Department of Finance and assessments. Uh, I think that the answers are that if our taxes are wrong um, and we've got something in specific cases that it seem to be um, uh, discordant with logic, then we're interested in understanding them. Um, I think that um, we hear you ask a question what the right return is. I, I don't have, it's not my job to make the number of what people should want to risk. And, and you know, um, uh, uh, these things, return comes in, in at least two ways. It, it comes in the income that's earned, and it also comes from the appreciation of the asset, which no one has mentioned. That if someone, if assets appreciate, that's a second form of return that people get too, that can supplement and complement uh, the cash on cash returns that you were using using to develop your calculation. So I, I think that I don't have anything else to add to that. Um, familiar with your background in, in uh, the private sector and in the Treasury Department, uh, or considering that, I'm, I'm curious if you find that city politics presents a different kind of thicket <laughs> um, and specific barriers to getting things done that you haven't encountered elsewhere before. Well, it's different. Um, it's really a privilege to have any of these types of jobs. Uh, but the, the big difference, I think, between the federal government and the, the local government is it's much closer to the ground where you feel a much uh, a greater pulse of the citizens and what you're trying to respond to. Uh, and um, you know, on the way in, a friend stopped to fill me in on his view of the potholes, uh, and I'm sure that other people have similar perspectives. Uh, and I just think that there's a proximity that's, um, that's different in terms of how you deal with things. Um, the engagement uh, with the legislative branch of the city council is much more active than it would be in the federal government. So again, you're prob solving problems where the, the proximity to issues is just different. Uh, and also, I think that if you, if you said um, how much of the, the time is spent on practical solving versus policy and longer term issues, it would be a higher ratio towards things that are immediate and focused of today. Uh, and, um, and I think <clears throat> the executive uh, position is a relatively strong one uh, from a civics perspective, uh, that the executive in the city example has a, a bit more latitude. And also, that's a function of term, time and term, too. Four years ago, Amanda Burden came to a Crane's breakfast and she said the fashion district would be rezoned. It has not been rezoned to make uh, that real estate more productive. Can you tell us what, if anything, is going on with, with the fashion district? And will we see any results in the remaining years of the Bloomberg administration? So, um, great question. Uh, um, I think the short answer is it's something we're looking at, um, that it's reshaping itself in the sense that the size and scale of what, what was once there is not appropriate. Uh, um, and, and so I think trying to, f to help engage with the private sector to determine what are the right business models, what can we do in that, that area to make it vibrant and a, a, a touch point for the industry given the changes in the business models, what we're focused on. And I'm hopeful we can come back uh, the, and the answer to your last question, but yes, I'm hopeful we can have guidance and ambition as to what we'd like it to be uh, in the third term. Can you tell our audience what the primary obstacle has been there? Has it been the garment industry? Has it been the Hotel Trades Council? What has been the obstacle? I think it's really the question of deciding what it is you... you no, I don't think that's right to pin the blame on any one person. Uh, I think it's a function of figuring out what we'd like to encourage, what we think of the shape of the community should be, and understanding what, what will be sustainable from a private sector perspective over long periods of time and getting everyone to the table. When I speak to people, I don't find that any perspective is way out. What I find is that we're probably going to have to get everybody to give a bit as you go through all the different perspectives that you, all the different parties that you suggested. Um, you talked about the need for subsidies in some cases and allowing developers to have a reasonable rate of return on their investments. I wonder in that context how open you are to the living wage movement. Um, they say if you are going to, um, you know, help guarantee a decent rate of return uh, for the owners, 
that there should be some kind of um, uh, involvement on the part of the city where there is a public subsidy that there be a living wage for those involved in building or doing other kinds of related work. Yeah, uh, first of all, let me just uh, interact with a question. I'm not sure there's a guaranteed level of return uh, uh, with just because there's a subsidy. Uh, and so there's still risk and whatever. So I'm not sure I completely accept mm -hmm. the description. Uh, um, so that changes the setup a little bit. Uh, um, but, but I think really with regard to this that, um, you know, our position in the administration has been pretty straightforward that uh, we believe the marketplace should be the setter of wages. Uh, and um, there's currently a study uh, that is being um, organized by EDC to look at this issue. That will be reporting back this summer. And it will be interesting to see what we learn from that because uh, it's always good to have new information and new perspective. But our basic philosophy has been historically that this should be a marketplace that sets this as opposed to having a predetermined wage uh, legislatively that attaches to any project. Then, then why shouldn't the marketplace also determine whether uh, certain business projects can go forward on their own, uh, you know, again, at the development or ownership level? Well, I, I think they do, uh, um, but there is some element of, um, of government engagement because of larger issues that we think you're, you're developing at the same time. But I would go back and say to the point I tried to make in re-engaging on your question that it's not as if there's no element of risk to this. Well, on the subsidy question, how do you decide when there should be a subsidy when you shouldn't just leave things up to the free marketplace. I mean, the mayor has said you know, New York City is a luxury pro pro uh, product and people want to be here. We just create the conditions. But then there are specific projects where there are tax breaks, where there are subsidies um, of one kind or another. How do you decide what projects uh, should receive them and does it have anything to do with the types of jobs that those projects produce? Well. Uh, um So my approach to that would be that um, when we think about where we want to, to put the thumb on the scale or provide subsidy or support, as you describe it, then I believe it should be because of larger policy ambitions and not so much project specific, but related to large policy ambitions. And if those relate to the, the new market uh, housing place plan, where we believe we want to create a certain number of affordable housing options um, over a period of time, then we have to ask ourselves what support is needed to be able to accomplish that. Uh, similarly, uh, we make decisions on allocating uh, public capital to subsidize uh, transportation, parks, other areas all the time. And so I think it really should be when we think we're uh, accomplishing very large brush strokes of public policy along the lines of housing ambitions, jobs, and things like that. And retail? How does that fit in, in that picture? Well, I, I think that um, I'm not exactly sure. Well, retail has taken a beating because the jobs don't pay particularly well, and um, yet the city continues to at least talk about subsidizing retail projects. Obviously, Kingsbridge didn't happen, but there will be another project you know, next month or next year, and we'll be back where we were. Um, have we written off subsidizing retail, or will we come back to that? Well, I, I think we'll see what, what um, options present themselves. Me speculating on who might come with what projects uh, I don't think is, is really the right way to approach it. Uh, and you know, we need to have a pyramid of jobs that have entry level and the ability to move up. Uh, and um, I think that um, the administration has been pretty clear that we want to be supportive of all types of business. And so, uh, um, but we have not been interested in engaging on the wage issue that you're uh, walking around. Um, I'd like to ask you about the financial sector, uh, which obviously you're familiar with. And of course, we all want to uh, concentrate on diversifying the city's economy. But the financial sector is still the bedrock of the tax base, base and generates, you know, a ton of jobs. Um, and it's been shrinking, I guess, for a whole variety of reasons, as you know, from 9-11 to 9-15 and, and beyond. Does the administration have a strategy at this point for growing or at least retaining as many financial sector jobs as possible? Well, um, I, I think that uh, it's interesting to watch the financial sector uh, adjust and respond to the different 
uh, changes in what um, the regulations are and what consumers uh, want to. Um, there's no question that we're seeing lots of changes in the whole landscape apart from New York City. Uh, and I think that um, you would want to say that um, um, we're certainly engaged with the very large um, employers in the city um, and their business models are changing and we're basically talking to them about keeping jobs in New York, bringing more jobs to New York, and that seems to be something that we want to, again, uh, I don't think it's up to us to determine which business will be successful. We should make it so that successful businesses want and can be here, uh, as opposed to trying to figure out what the right business strategies are. In some ways, I think the financial services sector, if we'd sat here uh, three years or four years ago, uh, we wouldn't have guessed it would have bounced back as strongly as it has. Uh, um, and the cyclical effects have actually been more positive than you and I might have, at least that I would have guessed. So maybe you would have had it figured out, but, but it's been coming back. I think the second question, are the regulatory responses and how that plays out over the longer period of time. I do think, though, that it would be wrong not to observe that lots of the uh, more nimble, smaller businesses in financial services, asset management, uh, private equity, and things like that, have had very robust periods uh, and are um, still strong and large and important and growing in New York. And that's an important part of the tax base you alluded to, uh, as opposed to just counting heads. It's a matter of the value of different heads, too. And in terms of the value game, I think it's been a pretty good period, actually, which would recast the question a little bit differently. Since the mayor announced that the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade would move and not go down 7th Avenue and through Times Square uh, next year and the year after, you have been meeting with the businesses that were angered by that decision. My question is, is this still under consideration? Uh, and, if it's, and if a change is not under consideration, then what is the subject of these meetings that you're having? So um, let me um, see if I can answer that um, pretty directly. Um, number one is that a decision was announced that this year the parade would be going uh, down 7th Avenue through Avenue through Times Square, um, and that the following two years it would be going down 6th Avenue. Um, it was apparent from the reaction uh, that um, I believe that, um, that we should have done a better job of listening and engaging with all the different constituents from both perspectives. Uh, um, bef uh, we could have done a better job earlier. Uh, and so uh, in wanting to understand their perspective, uh, we've had meetings, they've been informative, and I think we'll have more meetings. Uh, as of now, we have a decision, uh, but we're going to meet and learn and understand, and we'll see where that goes. Um, question about the capital budget. Um, if, if the capital budget has to shrink, if you accept that premise in these times, what would you say are the mayors and your top priorities for spending what we have. Everyone, of course, says infrastructure is important to being future-oriented. Have you prioritized projects based on shrinking possibilities or any other scenario? I think that, um, as you know, um, the operating budget and all the various budgets, we're now in the final process. We kind of know where we stand pretty much with the state. Uh, we don't know where we stand with the federal government. Um, and that has a large effect also. So the plan really is I think the next month we'll get to all of that uh, and, um, and you'll hear a lot more when we come back with the executive budget uh, in about a month. Uh, I think that um, you know, this mayor deserves a lot of credit uh, for having been uh, aware um, uh, five, six, seven years ago and putting money aside and we've gone through nine or ten uh, cost uh, reductions uh, throughout the administration to bring the budget in line. Uh, I think we're at the stage now where we'll start to think about this. You know, my experience is there are two philosophies, um, <clears throat> and um, I think that uh, one is to uh, reduce everything relatively equally, um, uh, or the kind of diet approach, and the other is to prioritize and decide a bit more forcefully we're going to continue to do this and we're going to slow this down or delay this. I personally think that when you've gone through as many reductions as we have, that the further diet strategy is not right and that we should make some explicit decisions as to this is what we're going to wait and put more on and this is where we're going to decide to do less. And so we'll be able to explain all that, I think, in the next month or so. If I could follow up on Please. your reference to not knowing what's coming from the federal government, um, have you started to look at all or is it just too early at the potential implications for New York 
of the Paul Ryan plan for reforming entitlements? No. I think that, um, you know, I, I've uh, read what you've read in the op-ed in the journal this morning, and so um, I think he's starting, and I thought David Brooks's column was about as endorsing as you could have had, which was kind of interesting, I thought, too, uh, to, have, uh, um, to have this pulled to the center uh, by someone from the center I thought was kind of interesting, too. I don't know if that was your impression from reading the, the things this morning. But um, so my, my take would be that um, no, but, but I do think in a way, if I could make an analogy, I think that I've been disappointed by both parties um, up until this point by not focusing on entitlements in their discussion about the budget. Uh, it's been a purposeful strategy with the idea that the first person to touch the issue loses uh, as if it's kind of a third rail, and I think that was wrong, so I'm glad someone's talking about the issue. We have our own analogous issue in government, uh, and uh, back to what one of you said a second ago about kind of giving us a courage pill to take on hard issues, given the fact that we're not running, we take that same approach to how we're thinking about pensions, and that we're trying to raise this issue, which I think is analogous in our life to entitlements with the federal government, where these are hard issues that, that no one wants to deal with. There's no joy in dealing with them quick, there's no quick joy in dealing with them, but there is a real responsibility to deal with them longer term to make sure that we do the right things, and I view them as the equivalent of our entitlements. We're going to have to save that for the next Crane's Breakfast because we are out of time. I would like to thank Deputy Mayor Robert Steele. You've been watching the Cranes New York Business Breakfast on April 5th at the Sheraton in Midtown. That was Deputy Mayor for Economic Development Bob Steele giving remarks and then being interviewed in front of an audience eating breakfast at the Sheraton, interviewed by Eric Enquist from Cranes and myself. This is Brian TV, where new media meets New York. You can watch us anytime on our website, TV. see our archive at your convenience. And I hope you'll join me for my radio show on WNYC Radio, AMA 20 and 93.9, weekday mornings at 10. Talk to you then. See you next week on TV.